Hey guys, today we are comparing the new Sony ZV-E10 with its older but smaller brother, the ZV-1. Will this be like the Arnold Schwarzenegger documentary Twins, where one brother is clearly genetically superior, or will it be like the Arnold Schwarzenegger documentary Terminator 2, where we have two very evenly matched machines? We are going to focus today mainly on vlogging and videography applications, since that is what Sony markets both of these cameras towards, but don't worry, we're going to have plenty of cinematic b-roll and slick slow motion to compensate for the lack of Danny DeVito and Linda Hamilton. Is there anything else worth saying before we start? My good Good friend, future Dave. You're a moron and I hate you, past Dave. Oh, you mean worth saying about the video? Well, I've already done in-depth reviews of the ZV-1 and the ZV-E10, so you can check those out for more detail and test footage. These studio sections are showcasing the results you can get with the ZV-E10 and Sigma 30mm f1.4 lens. If you want to see the kind of studio results you can get with the ZV-1, apart from this very quick comparison I'm showing right now, there is a full video on that. There are timestamps for everything we will cover in the description, along with product links in case you decide to pick up either of our cameras or some of the other gear we talk about today. And if you like today's video, then like, subscribe, and let me know your questions or thoughts down in the comments. But first, let's spend some time on stabilization. Can we go from more jerky than a dried meat festival to smoother than a Morgan Freeman bedtime story? So first up, standard steady shot, and I apologize in advance. I know the ZV-E10, because I tested more recently with the kit lens, has an experience about as stable as a C6 Shia LaBeouf during an earthquake, which might not be the greatest to watch. The ZV-E1, I haven't looked at standard steady shot for a little while, but I don't remember it being great now for active steady shot. And it's worth saying both cameras are on a combined rig, and I'm using the Gorilla Pod as a grip extension to hold them out. Active works pretty well on the ZV-1, less well in my recent experience on the ZV-E10. And the price of Active is a crop in. I think it's around 20 to 25% on the ZV-1, but around 43% from the recent comprehensive review I did on the ZV-E10. Now, let's see if we can mitigate the big problem with Active stabilization, which is that crop and tighter viewing angle that you get with it. How are we gonna do that? By using a wider lens for each camera. On the ZV-1, we're using the Ulanzi wide-angle lens, which I've tested before and which has done a really nice job. On the ZV-E10, I'm using the fairly new Samyang 12mm f2.0, which we touched on briefly in the ZV-E10 deep dive review, but I will be doing a full review of that lens as well. So the question here is, is that viewing angle okay? Have we successfully drawn attention away from the not-so-good-to-look-at face? and towards the much better to look at environment. And now you are looking at Catalyst browse stabilization, which is where I expect to see the best results. Catalyst can deliver, and in my experience has delivered consistently excellent results, but it does have two major drawbacks. First is the fact that it's a post-production extra step in your workflow, and therefore you also can't see what the results are going to look like in camera. Second is that it is good with a high shutter speed. So in good light vlogging situations like this, not a problem, stick on aperture priority mode, you probably never have to think about it. But in low light, where you'll have a slower shutter speed, or if you want to stick to the cinematic one over 50 for the motion blur, then you're gonna have to limit your movements to relatively slow sedate ones, or end up with problems in the footage. Moving on, we are going to try and kill two birds with one stone. Now, apart from that phrase being an approbation of aimless avian annihilation, we are gonna go on to another A, which is audio. We've switched to the onboard mics of the ZV-1 and the ZV-E10. And first, I wanna show you how effective the wind fluff can be. We're by the river. This isn't just terrible hair. This is terrible hair plus quite a lot of wind. And the ZV-1 has the wind fluff attached. The ZV-E10 doesn't. So hopefully I'm right, and in post we're gonna hear that makes a really significant difference. The other point I wanted to cover here is around stabilization. The ZV-E10 did a better job with active steady shot when I came to review that initial footage than I expected and than I thought based on my initial in-depth review. But what do you think? This has been active steady shot with those same wide lenses on both cameras. Does the ZV-E10 deserve a second chance? Maybe. I do think the longer and heavier grip might have helped the ZV-E10, but I will need to do more testing to have a proper conclusion. And either way, I still think the ZV-1 does a better job overall on stabilization. Watch out for the corner wobble you get with the ZV-E10 to really see the difference. 
Speaking of wobble, the ZB-E10 has significant rolling shutter on fast side-to-side -side movements, which could well be contributing to that corner stabilization wobble. More visual jelly than a sumo wrestler twerking ceremony. Let's talk about built-in mics instead, where the three capsule directional mics are a key marketing point for both cameras. The mics are usable, definitely better than the built-in options you'll get on most cameras, and they do a decent job emphasizing voices, but they're definitely not a replacement for a dedicated mic. So now let's go from one heavily marketed shared feature to another. Both the ZV-E10 and the ZV-1 have a relatively unique feature compared to the rest of the Sony line and, as far as I know, most of their competitors, which is product showcase mode. This is great if you want to show off an object. It's eye autofocus until you put an object closer to the camera at which point, even if you're in the frame, you'll get the lovely blur on you and the sharp focus on the object. Now, in my experience, this works really nicely and really consistently on both cameras. The only real difference you'll find is there are more settings to control your focus speed and things, which we'll get into later on the ZV-E10. And of course, you can also change up your lenses on the ZV-E10. So if I get a nice amount of blur on both cameras, it's worth saying I've got the autofocus transition speed to slow for that more cinematic look right now. But the amount of blur we've got on the ZV-E10, we can increase with our interchangeable lens options. And of course, that's gonna be a theme we talk about throughout the video. Perhaps you want that buttery smooth background bokeh blur. Well, the ZV-1 can give you really nice results, especially for macro shots, because it has an insanely good close focus. But for this category, there really only is one runaway winner. And that's the ZV-E10, thanks to its interchangeable lenses. If you pull out something like the Sigma 16mm f1.4, then you can get smoother bokeh than the most bountiful butter and with far less saturated fat. The Sigma has a 24mm full-frame equivalent field of view, which is the same as the built-in lens on the ZV-1. So you can try and match up your shots and set both cameras to f1.8, which is what you're seeing here. However, what you're going to find is the ZV-E10 still destroys the ZV-1 for bokeh thanks to its larger sensor. There's a deep dive explaining how sensor size impacts bokeh linked in the description. Switch to the Sigma 30mm f1.4 and you'll have not just that super wide aperture but also a tighter focal length equivalent to around 45mm full frame field of view. That combination of aperture and optical compression is going to give you more blur than a censorship masterclass. Now, you can try to replicate the field of view zooming in slightly on the ZV-1 to around 45 mil, but you aren't going to get similar results because you have the much smaller sensor and a narrower aperture. And speaking of zoom, if you zoom in enough, you can get some badass bokeh through optical compression, as we mentioned before. That's what you're seeing here with the Sony 18 to 105 f4 lens fully zoomed in on the ZV-E10 and the built-in lens fully zoomed in to its 70 mil max on the ZV-1. And once again, you can probably see a fairly significant difference. It's also worth adding that everything we've talked about in terms of bokeh being more flexible and expandable on the ZV-E10 also applies to field of view. With the ZV-1, you can get some nice lens attachments like the Ulanzi to give you a wider angle or some really credible and nice macro options. But ultimately, there's quite a big difference here. The ZV-1 is a bit like a couple that dresses up for each other to keep some variety happening, whereas the ZV-E10 are full-blown swingers where their variety is a lot more tangible and different. This might be our first category that had a really clear winner, and it is the ZV-E10 which came out on top. Let's not think about that phrase in the context of that last strange analogy, but I do wonder, is there a category where the ZV-1 would be the clear winner? Funny you should say that because now I want to talk about slow motion. Not because of my offensively bad low budget Matrix remake, but because it's an important feature with both cameras. Both of them can film up to 120 frames per second with audio, which is what you're seeing and hearing now, and which allows for seamless Slowdowns. The ZV-E10 also includes a nice one-button shortcut to S and Q mode, which is a really quick and convenient way to get already slowed down footage, albeit without audio and in slightly lower quality. But it's the ZV-1, which is like Neo in a hall full of Agent Smiths with incredible ultra slow motion bursts up to 1000 frames per second. 
While this is limited to a recording time of just a few seconds, the results that you can get with it are incredible. And unlike anything you'll find on the ZV-E10 or even more pricey alternatives. What we can say right now is I think this category is a clear win for the ZV-1. Quite a bit to recap there. You saw that the ZV-E10 can be the bastion of breathtaking bokeh, but only if you're willing to invest in the right lenses. You might have noticed the ZV-1 lost focus on me a few times in that talking head slow motion segment. Well, hold that thought because before we cover autofocus, low light and more, we should cover design, build quality and price. Both cameras are in a similar price bracket. The ZV-1 has a list price of £700, while the ZV-E10 is 679 for the body only and 779 with the kit lens. We get a fully articulating flip screen on each and both work about as well as any Sony screen, so they have limited touch capability, not the highest resolution, but do their main job well enough. The ZV-1 screen does dim a bit in 4K and 120 FPS, while the ZV-E10 does not, so that's helpful when it's bright. Dimensions and weights for both cameras are on screen now. The ZV-1 is truly pocketable, also definitely a word, while the ZV-E10 will be bulkier with most nicer lenses. Both cameras get microphone inputs and video output via micro HDMI, but while the ZV-1 is limited to micro USB for both charging and data, the ZV-E10 gets the superior USB-C connection and an additional headphone output. In 4K 24 frames per second, the ZV-1 tapped out after just under an hour, in line with my other tests which has it recording for between 55 and 65 minutes, while the ZV-E10 gets just over an hour and a half a definite win on battery life for the ZV-E10. The heart of these cameras is of course the sensor, and this is another area where the ZV-E10 has the advantage. It's got a 24 megapixel APS-C sensor that has a surface area more than three times the 20.1 megapixel one inch sensor of the ZV-1. Both cameras are nice enough considering their price and capability, but the ZV-E10 just feels a bit more solid in terms of finish, nice in the hands, nicer buttons and so forth. Now it's time to act like alone and address those earlier cliffhangers on autofocus and low light. The short version is that both cameras have great autofocus in good light. They'll both give you video eye tracking which works really well and both of them give you some control over autofocus transition speed and how sticky the lock on is. You saw in the slow motion section that the ZV-1 struggled a bit with autofocus in 120p. Now I've never seen that before but it was a side-by-side -side test and the ZV-E10 had no such problems. Both cameras have touch tracking autofocus which works well and allows for nice rack focus results. The ZV-1 wins on autofocus consistency though. It has that built-in lens, so once you understand it, you know how it's gonna behave in every situation. Whereas with the ZV-E10, different lenses can have quite different experiences. A good example is how my Samyang lens behaved in low light compared to the Sigma 16mm f1.4 that I've got really good results with in the past. So what do we need to do now? We need to test low light. Now, there are a lot of variables here, so I need to do a deep dive low light test for the ZV-E10, the same way that I have already for the ZV-1. Links in the description. However, we can, like an adult advert, offer something quick and dirty. Some real simple vlogging comparisons. And straight away, one good thing about the ZV-E10 can also be a drawback, because what I've learned so far is the low light autofocus on that Samyang 12mm plane sucks. Full review of that lens, and I need to explore it in detail, but we are using manual focus right now just to have something to compare. And now we are at a max ISO of 3200, which combined with some better lighting is enough exposure for the Samyang to deem me worthy of having autofocus back again. It's also the same level I would normally use as a maximum for the ZV-1 in low light before we get noise issues. So how is it doing? And more interestingly, is the ZV-E10 like the adult advert showing that size does matter, except this time it's sensor size which should give it an advantage in low light. And our final quick vlogging test now at a max ISO of 6400, but is the ZV-1 going to be suffering with more noise than a Cardi B B-side, or is the ZV-E10 going to be like its brother the A6400 and my abs during the pandemic struggling with mushy softness? And does future Dave have any comments to add about low light? Yes. 
Oh, I, uh, I probably should say what they are now, right? You saw that both cameras can struggle and lose focus in low light and that the Samyang 12mm gave me some focus headaches, but I need to properly test that lens before I write off its low light abilities. Overall, the ZV-1 punches above its weight in low light in my opinion, but noise definitely gets noticeable at higher ISOs. The ZV-E10 definitely gives a cleaner image at the same ISO settings and combined with investing in good f1.4 or similar lenses, it is going to give you better overall low light performance than the ZV-1. The last point to cover before we conclude is colors. Throughout the video we've matched all the picture profile and white balance settings across both cameras. Originally I locked them at 5500k and noticed some color differences, then I put both of them on auto white balance to see if that would get them closer to each other. But no, there is a color difference. Colors are subjective and perhaps this is only the HLG profile. If I had more time maybe I would test the other profiles, but what I can say confidently is that both cameras give you nice looking colors and leave plenty of room for grading. Perhaps you have a preference. Let me know down in the comments who you conclude is your king of colors and speaking of conclusions, it's time to summarize and both cameras do a great job on most of the fundamentals. So we're gonna focus on the differences. Who is the ZV-1 best for? Somebody who wants a simple but powerful experience, plenty of room to expand and learn, but not having to worry about the cost, the variability and the choice of lots of different lenses. You will limit your potential beautiful blurry background bokeh and your options around wider or tighter fields of view, but in exchange you get crazier slow motion than the Quicksilver guy from the X-Men movies. As a walk around vlogging camera, I do think the stabilization is a bit better in the ZV-1 than the ZV-E10, thanks to a better version of active steady shot. And as a studio camera, the ZV-1 is going to do a great job, but you still will have that limitation around the maximum bokeh you can achieve. For a moron like me that is easily entertained by anything shiny or in this case blurry, that is a limitation, but for a lot of people it won't be. And who is the ZV-E10 for? People who want options and expandability and don't mind the lens investment that is needed to get those things. You'll benefit from bountiful bokeh with some lenses able to achieve results right up there with the best full frame setups, plus a near infinite range of options for focal length. And if you're prepared to get the lenses that can handle it, the ZV-E10 can be more of a boss in cinematic low light than Marlon Brando in The Godfather. For me, the ZV-1 is my camera of convenience. Always super portable, quick, easy, and fun to pick up, and with that slow motion secret source. Plus, it's significantly cheaper than the ZV-E10 if you intend to pick up any lenses for that camera, which kind of is the point. The ZV-E10 is still new, but for me, fits a nice spot just below the A7C, where I can get really similar image quality to that full frame system, but with cameras and lenses that are far lighter and cheaper. Plus, I'm getting all the nice ZV line video features. However, of course, you need to still budget for and invest in those lenses. So, what's your use case and which camera is best for you? Let me know down in the comments. And since that brings us to the end for today, I wanna to say a massive thank you for watching, especially making it to the end of this pretty long video. If you enjoyed it, then like, subscribe, and most importantly, until next time, take it easy.